Symphigear might be one of the most anime anime series I've ever seen. It's hard to find a show as over the top and that incorporates so many tropes and ideas from anime and general otaku culture. This is a show that takes elements of tokusatsu henshin heroes, magical girls, mecha, idols, yuri, and even cute girl shows, and blends them together into a new experience that separates itself from its influences and carves its own singular identity. Part of which comes from its absolutely ridiculous gimmick. The hero's transformations are powered by music. They have to sing to fight. It could be in part because of this ridiculousness, but Symphogear hasn't gotten a lot of attention from most Western anime fans. Which is tragic, because this is a truly, finely crafted action series. And I think it hasn't reached a lot of the audience that would enjoy it. Do you like ridiculous, spectacle-filled action? Well, Symphogear has that. Do you enjoy a good old-fashioned, idealistic hero speech? Symphogear has that too. Do you get hype when a show hits its climax and the theme song kicks in? Symphogear definitely has that. But if that's not enough to convince you this show is worth your time, don't worry. I can think of another reason or two. Symphigear focuses around a team of high school girls employed by a secret government organization who use the power of ancient relics to fight the noise, mysterious monsters of unknown origins. These relics, when activated, give the girls the ability to don Symphigears, armor capable of protecting them from the creature's ability to turn humans into carbon, effectively disintegrating them. The Symphigears are fueled by what is known in series as Phonic Gain, energy coming from the power of music. And this is where the aforementioned singing comes in. In every fight, in order to power their suits, one of the girls will sing their individual character theme, which serves both as the in-universe source of their power and as an exciting backing track for the viewer watching the action unfold. At the center of all of this is the series' main character, Tachibana Hibiki the wielder of the Gungnir Symphogear. Prior to the main events of the series, while being protected from the noise by Gungnir's previous owner, she is accidentally impaled with shrapnel that breaks off the armor. Two years later, she finds herself cornered by the noise once again, and unintentionally activates the shard in her chest, donning the Gungnir armor herself. From here, she joins the only other currently active Symphogear, Kanazari Tsubasa, and helps in the fight to protect humanity. Hibiki struggles at first, but after a training montage where she watches kung fu movies, does random exercises, and cosplays as Makoto from Street Fighter, she quickly comes into her own, becoming an indispensable member of the team. The noise are just the beginning of the threats that the Symphogears face. Behind this horde of monsters are multiple villains with various motivations, including the creator of the Symphogears, a mad scientist with a savior complex, a band of monster girls, a Japanese nationalist, and the Illuminati. But, no matter what enemy shows up, Hibiki, alongside the other Symphigears, faces them head on, punching her way through any threat until they're defeated or become her friend. Now, this all may sound a little dumb, and it kinda is, but if there's one thing I've learned is that just because a story has a goofy concept does not mean it's not smartly constructed. Symphigear was co-created by Agamatsu Noriyasu, one of the founders of the Japanese musical collective Elements Garden and by Kaneko Akifumi, the series scriptwriter. The show was mostly conceptualized by Agamatsu, which is unsurprising considering how prominent of a role music plays in the series. Outside of the aforementioned singing while fighting, there are idol concerts, speeches about the power of song, and visualizer effects all over the place. But this is basically just a thematic layer over what is, at its core, a transforming hero show. Transforming Hero, or Henshin Hiro, is a genre popularized by tokusatsu series such as Kamen Rider and Super Sentai, which you are probably more familiar with in its recut version, Power Rangers. The core elements of these series are all here. Transformation sequences, enemies becoming friends, new powered up forms, waves of faceless goons to stylishly beat down, etc. 
They even have signature named attacks, though they don't yell the names, probably because they're busy singing. When I initially watched Symphogear though, I viewed all of this through the context of Magical Girl series instead, which isn't so surprising. Sailor Moon was inspired in part by Super Sentai, and the many team-based Magical Girl series it inspired share a similar template. So a show like this one that shares a lot of common elements with Super Sentai will also have a lot of similarities with Magical Girl shows. Symphogear combines aspects of both, but I feel like it leans a little bit more towards Henshin Hiro motifs. It has skin-tight colored battle outfits instead of frilly dresses, the characters use weapons and martial arts instead of magical sticks, and there are no hearts or sparkles or anything of the like to be found. Beyond these elements though, Symphogear also mirrors the struggles and characters with those series. It's targeted towards an older audience, and both the characters and world have a clear level of complexity to them. However, the core motivations for each character's actions at any given time are based around a relatively simple perspective on that world. Hibiki simply likes helping those in need, and doesn't want to fight anyone, even if they are dangerous. Tsubasa views herself as a protector, and will go to great lengths to save those that can't defend themselves. And Chris, who starts out as an enemy, wants to stop all conflict in the world by becoming strong enough to force others to stop fighting. In a lesser series, hearing the characters spout their ideals to each other may seem cheesy, but Symphogear pulls it off extremely well. There's a balancing act it performs, where it's simultaneously sincere about the ideals that the characters believe in, and knows when to treat things with the proper gravity, but also doesn't take itself too seriously. Like in one episode, you'll learn about a secret plot to cover up a world-ending disaster, but then in the next, there's a very futuristic giant screen displaying the possible outcome with the text, Serious Damage. Symphogear takes from its influences and uses them to build its own story template. Each season generally focuses around a new, mysterious group of enemies, one of which, at least, is sympathetic. The protagonists' worldviews will be challenged by those of the villains, but ultimately the heroes will find conviction in their ideals and defeat their foes, usually convincing them that their methods are wrong in the process. It's a formula, but it's a compelling one, and is flexible enough that each of the five seasons manages to be enjoyable in its own way. Well, okay. Four of the five seasons managed to be enjoyable. The single biggest catch to any recommendation of Symphogear is the fact that season one simply is not very good. It's poorly paced, character arcs are abrupt and jerky, motivations aren't made clear, and it's not very good looking. Apparently Kaneko condensed multiple seasons worth of Akifumi's ideas into a single one core story and it shows. It feels like there's things missing, as if important elements were simply omitted, and they probably were. The lackluster quality of this season is unfortunate, and is likely one of the biggest barriers to Symphogear seeing wider success as a series. But aside from its specific issues, season one also introduces elements of the show that would bother me throughout its entire run. These being one, the designs, and two, what I expect to be my most surprising take in the eyes of other Symphogear fans, the music. Neither of these are part of what makes season one bad. That's mostly plot and visual quality issues. It's more that both are inconsistent and not appealing to my usual tastes. Focusing on the design specifically, from a technical standpoint they're all distinct and have recognizable silhouettes and such, but aesthetically, Hibiki's is the only one whose general and Symphogear designs I can say I like without reservation. Chris is close, but the weird anime girl mullet hairstyle she has going on always bothers me. It pops up occasionally on designs I otherwise like, but I've never been able to get over how weird it looks. That one hang up aside, I like her design as well, and her casual outfit in this season is one of the best in the entire series. Tsubasa is the real miss of the three. I know her hair is supposed to resemble an eighth note, but it just looks kinda stupid. And the ankle swords on her symphogears are awkward and weird looking. Somehow, nothing came together for her. Symphogear's music is a similar story. It can be incredibly good at times, but especially during my first watch of the series, I wasn't feeling it. 
It's actually pretty difficult to talk about this show without discussing the music. It's extremely core to Symphagear's identity, and I have a lot of respect for the effort and thought I can tell has been put into it. Each character gets at least two new songs written for them every season, incorporating elements from each of their assigned musical themes. For example, Hibiki's theme is Celtic music. Why? I don't know. Neither Hibiki nor Gungnir are Celtic. Maybe they just thought it sounded heroic. Additionally, all the songs have lyrics relating to the characters' personalities and struggles throughout the show. These aspects of the soundtrack are really cool, and I like a lot of the parts of the songs that play into the themes. The chants and traditional Japanese instrumentation in Zetto Ame no Habakiri are sick, and totally fit Tsubasa's Japanese rock theme. However, this and many of the other songs eventually devolve into incredibly Anisani, synthy, electronic rock partway through. When I say that Symphagear is very anime, I mean that as a compliment, but in this case it leans into that description in a way that's less appealing to me. Which is unfortunate. I mean, it seems like they even went so far as to select the voice actresses based on their musical experience. All of the main cast have either a singing career, formal vocal training, or both. Mizuki Nana was even involved in the songwriting process, both writing and performing all of the series' openings. And at its best, the effort put into the soundtrack does lead to some bangers. The focal synth line in Watashi to Yu Oto Hibiki Sono Saki ni is too infectious for me to hate. And Makyui Chibaru's high octane take on metal results in an absolute headbanger. But on the whole, most of the songs were just okay. So why, after talking about these hangups, am I trying to convince you that Symphagear is worth watching? In all honesty, I was about to drop the show after I finished season 1, but while it was clearly not great, it does have a strange charm to it. Unlike some bad shows, it didn't feel soulless, just poorly executed. There were a lot of unique ideas and cool lore that made me interested to see more, and it was actually a clip of Kirika donning her Simpha gear in Season 5 that got me to try the show out at all. What can I say? I'm a sucker for a good transformation sequence. So out of a combination of curiosity for where the series would go, and the knowledge that at some point the visual quality would improve, I convinced myself to take a peek at Season 2 before I stopped watching. I don't think I've ever had my opinion on a show changed so quickly between seasons. Season 2 of Symphagear, titled Symphagear G, cuts all of the fat from the first, refining itself into a tight, exciting action experience. It hits the ground full speed in Episode 1, showing off the new character designs, upgraded animation quality, and improved fight choreography. In what will become a tradition for the series, the first episode of the season makes a statement, with spectacular set pieces that lay the groundwork for what's to come. The setup for G is a classic Henshin hero on. New villainous characters with the same powers as the protagonists suddenly appear. With unknown motivations, these new Symphagears declare war on the world, kicking off an exciting new story. And that story is told with immaculate pacing. The season makes brisk progress, changing the status quo frequently. While it's action-packed, it knows when to slow it down, but never lets things get sleepy. And with a perfectly placed hook at the end of each episode, you're always left excited for the next. But the most interesting thing about Symphagear G is that all of those issues I had before kind of start to dissipate. They're not really gone, but they stop bothering me and start to feel like an inseparable, essential part of the series. 
Take the new designs, for example. Thanks to a shuffling of staff between seasons, including a change of director and animation character designer, there's a clear difference in visual direction between Season 1 and G. But while it's been overhauled, this season still preserves the same core ideas from the first. Symphigear owes a lot of its design sensibility to the concept of Mecha Musume. While its origins can be traced back to Moe anthropomorphized Gundam illustrations from the 1980s, the term Mecha Musume comes from a specific line of figurines from the mid-2000s. The phrase, which literally means something like Mecha Girl, has come to refer to the idea of female characters with outfits and gear consisting mostly of mechanical elements. But unlike other, much worse shows that use this concept, like Infinite Stratos or Gonna Be the Twin Tail, Symphigear isn't afraid to have a lot of fun with the idea. In isolation, I would say that Kirika and Shirabe's Symphigears are too goofy looking for my tastes. But in the context of the rest of the show, they feel right at home. I mean, can you really hate a Chunibyo dressed up as the Grim Reaper that slaps death on the end of half of her sentences? Or a girl with weaponized twin tails gliding around a battlefield on motorized heelys? Beyond just the designs themselves, the way that the characters utilize their unique symphigears is also creative. Maria actually has a design that I like aesthetically, but it's made even better with the way that she fights using her cape. That's some true villain shit. It's fantastic. It's not just the new Symphigears that benefit from this though, the returning ones get redesigns as well. While Hibiki's shares a lot with her season 1 look, the adjustments she receives are nearly all for the better. The impractically long scarf in particular ups the cool factor quite a bit. Combined with improved mechanical design elements like the spinning gears in her gauntlets, seeing her in combat is much more satisfying than in the first season. Even Tsubasa gets a glow up this time around. I still don't like the leg swords, but they've been redesigned in a way that is definitely better. And as much as I hate to admit it, using them to fight while on her motorcycle is actually kinda sick. All of this again plays into that self-aware vibe that Symphigear has. It's campy, in just the right way and in just the perfect amount to bring out the fun and even the goofiest designs. This balance is also what allows the singing aspect to work without feeling as dumb as it actually is. The show knows the concept is ridiculous and doesn't care. In fact, it uses this aspect of the plot to its absolute maximum potential. My opinion on the quality of the songs may vary, but the way they're applied is nothing short of incredible. If normally, music in a show could be considered a fine tool that is applied carefully to set the mood of a scene, then Symphogear uses music like a battering ram, absolutely bombarding you with constantly increasing levels of hype. I'm sure you've seen a show before where it hits the climax and the theme song plays. Well, imagine that, but replace the theme song with character songs, and replace the climax with every fight in the show. Now, that may seem like it would cause you to lose the excitement you get from this kind of moment, but that's not the case. The variety of individual character songs combined with the group songs, the remixes, and the opening of each season itself are precisely sequenced in order to effectively escalate the intensity of each subsequent fight. Symphigear puts a serious amount of effort into making the music work, not only in where it places the tracks, but also in how they're made diegetic. At least some parts of the songs in the show were recorded in the studio, alongside the other voice actors, as if they were regular lines. And the leveling of the vocal tracks is adjusted based on the characters' positions and the current circumstances. This allows for the music to feel very naturally integrated. It's audible when characters are straining themselves during a fight, and they'll seamlessly stop singing at points when they need to focus more on combat. I love soundtracks because, unlike normal music, which I'm not trying to put down, don't get me wrong, they're tied to an experience, and the inability to separate the two can affect both your perception of a story and the feeling associated with the score. Across all media, many of the most resonant scenes that have stuck with me over time have been tied to music that really sells the moment. So while in a vacuum I may not vibe with Synthagear's music, 
when I go back and listen to it, it's hard to separate it from the feelings I had when watching the show itself. The soundtrack has actually grown on me some more recently, but with or without an appreciation for the music, the synergy between the show and the songs elevate each beyond what they would have been otherwise. And that's really the story of Symphagear as a whole. This show is the embodiment of the phrase, more than the sum of its parts. It's not perfectly written, it isn't the most flawlessly animated, and the designs may be inconsistent, but together, it is a one-of-a-kind experience. Symphagear G sets the standard for the series going forward, and the next two seasons, Symphagear GX and Symphagear Axes, continue to impress. Introducing new enemies, new transformations, extended lore, expansions on character backstories, and, of course, new songs, these seasons are both welcome additions to the series, preserving many of the strengths that emerged in G. They are more uneven. Both suffer from putting a little too much focus on uninteresting adversaries. I like Carol as the main villain in GX, but her mechanical autoscore henchmen, while conceptually interesting, are in practice boring, and are never fleshed out enough to become engaging characters. The interplay between Carol's backstory and how it mirrors Hibiki's past struggles is a good core theme, but a lot of time is given to the formulaic repeated encounters with the autoscorers in the first two thirds of the season or so, which makes GX feel the closest to the traditional monster of the week formula of all of Symphagear's seasons. The highs of GX are really good, and the later episodes that focus on the conflict with Carol are standouts. It just doesn't have the same spectacle rollercoaster feel as G. Axes has a similar issue. Saint Germain, Prelati, and Cagliostro serve as the henchmen in this season, following the lead of Adam Weishaupt, the head of the Bavarian Illuminati, a secret society of alchemists. However, they are significantly more interesting than Adam, particularly Saint Germain, which makes the final fight a little anticlimactic. Adam does a lot of terrible things in the season, so there's plenty of reason to dislike him, but he's so uninteresting it's hard to get invested in his ultimate confrontation with the Symphagears, which makes it less emotionally satisfying as an ending compared to the other seasons. On the whole though, both GX and Axes are quite good as well, especially for giving a deeper look into the Symphagears' pasts and personalities. Hibiki and Chris get a heavy focus in GX and Axes respectively, and it adds welcome explanations for why they act and think the way they do. These seasons also continue to have plenty of fantastic action scenes. The opening of GX is one of the quintessential moments of the entire show. When Hibiki punches a mountain in half, and the first reaction of the support team is... Any remaining doubt that Symphagear wasn't self-aware about how ridiculous it is, immediately vanished. This show knows what it's doing. And the capstone to top all of this off is the fifth season, Symphagear Exiv. What a send-off. Exiv is the pinnacle of the series, weaving together a multitude of plot elements and loose threads into a conclusion that embodies all of the aspects of the show at their best. Exiv also manages to overcome the issues I felt with the previous two seasons. All of its villains are interesting and have compelling reasons for you to care about their conflicts with the heroes. In fact, each of the three main antagonist factions has their own individual, fully formed stories that tie into the world and events built up throughout the prior seasons. If I had to criticize Exiv, I would say it stretches itself a little thin trying to do so much with the story, but it still manages to pull off some of the most effective moments the series has to offer. I think Tsubasa is one of the least interesting of the main cast, but the narrative they constructed for her here was extremely well done, and played on aspects of her character that had been built up from the very beginning of the show. Somehow, they even managed to get me interested in the obligatory idol concert this season. When I am watching an idol performance, and I'm like, this is kind of cool, actually. You know they nailed it. I don't like idols, but the flair of the camera work and creative stage design really grabbed my attention. Despite initially not appealing to me in some ways, Symphagear managed to win me over, and get me to enjoy aspects that I normally wouldn't. It's just that good but it does have some more enduring flaws that it couldn't quite overcome in the same way. In particular, 
there are some issues with tone. I don't mind a sprinkle of edge in my anime, but Symphagear almost gives you whiplash with the juxtaposition of his often goofy, idealistic feel and his darker moments. These scenes cover a lot of very sensitive, trigger-worthy topics, including child abuse, sexual abuse, human experimentation, and slavery, amongst others. They vary in how well they're executed and sometimes feel like a desperate attempt to remind you that this is a show for adults. Relatedly, while it is somewhat of a genre trope, it's hard to mentally reconcile the redemption some of the villains get when you actually think about their actions for a bit. I do think the way the series is able to get you to emotionally connect to the antagonists despite the atrocities they commit is impressive though, and one of the things that makes it memorable. And while I almost forgot it's there because I've been so heavily desensitized after years and years of anime, this series is pretty deeply infused with fan service. It's definitely not as egregious as some shows, but it's consistently present. I feel like I say this for almost everything I talk about, but if you don't like fan service, while this show does have more than that to offer, it may not be for you. Beyond those possible deal breakers, I can't recommend Symphagear enough. It's hard for me to show restraint when it comes to this series, it's just such a blast. Simply talking about it now is making me want to go and watch it again. I like Symphagear so much it got me to try out the mobile gacha game which is no small feat. I haven't gotten very far because it uses a lot of difficult kanji and my Japanese is worse than an elementary schooler, but still. I really hope that if you haven't, you give the show a shot. I mean it when I say Symphagear is a very anime anime. It is unashamed to be earnest about what it is, and the result is a truly fun and memorable action experience. The future for the series looks bright too. A new Symphagear project was just announced late last year. There are no details on it yet. It could be a new sequel, a prequel, an adaptation of the mobile game, or even a video game. Arxis, please, I'd sell my soul for a Symphagear fighting game. But no matter what the future of the franchise holds, the series as it is now is a fantastic, complete story. So there's no better time to pick it up, strap in, and enjoy the ride.